And we are going live in three, a two, a one. Nope, I was a little too early. Now you're live. <clears throat> what is up, Watch Fam? I am Christian from Theo and Harris, and welcome to this week's. Um, what are we doing? Uh, live. Ask T and H. Um, happy Saturday to YouTube. Happy Monday to Instagram. Um, Instagram, if you don't. YouTube, if you don't follow us on Instagram, uh, you really should. Uh, this is where you can actually see uh, when we're going live, so you can ask questions, uh, be a part of this whole event, um, but, uh, but that's it. It's fun on your end too, as YouTube, because it's live. <music> Hello, watch fam. Hello from India. Congrats on 2,000 followers on your personal account. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you guys uh, who do not follow me on my personal Instagram, you can go ahead. Uh, it's at Thelonious Zerone. Uh, Thelonious as in Thelonious Monk. Not that he and I share anything in common. Um, he, uh, it, really nothing. I, I can't even think of a single thing we share in common. Uh, do you do a wristwatch check? All right, quick wristwatch check. Uh, I am wearing a Rolex reference 1601, but it's not a normal 1601. It's not even a really cool 1601. It is one of the coolest 1601s. And I know I say that all the time, but it really is true. I've ever been able to find. Uh, it's actually steel uh, and pink gold. So it is two-tone, but not in any way you've ever really seen it before. I mean, look at that pink gold bezel. Uh, of course, pink gold indexes all around the dial, pink gold hands. Uh, and the silver dial is uh, not only you know in really you know, pretty damn good condition, but it has a little bit of that stardust kind of patina throughout that I absolutely love. Uh, yeah, awesome, right? Love it. Look at that on my wrist. I love that pink. I think what's so cool about the pink, you know, gold is it's a little bit more conservative. You know, it's a little bit more, um, I don't know, just easy to look at. I love yellow as well, but I can totally see why a lot of people think that yellow gold is, is just too blingy. Uh, it's, it's just too kind of like 80s and over the top. The pink gold avoids that entirely. Uh, the pink gold is just so much more uh, soft, you know, and subtle. Yeah, monkey wrench. That's funny. He just, uh, someone just spotted the monkey wrench on uh, in the back. Yes, this is a monkey wrench. Um, I, I, filled, I filled this wall that means something to me on one level or another. Um, you know, my original sneakers, the bottle that my parents opened when I got into college, you know, all, all like that. Um, and uh, all things that have kind of brought me here to this point. And uh, my grandpa is like, you know, a mechanic of sorts, like a casual mechanic. So uh, the monkey wrench was always something that I remember growing up. And uh, it's a part of my childhood. So yeah, we bring bring the whole family thing into into here at TNH. Uh, Cellini Moon Phase thoughts go. Um, I think the Rolex Cellini is one of the coolest watches um, in the market. Uh, not only for what it is, but for what I genuinely think it might become in the next five years. Uh, for two reasons. One, I have literally heard uh, from Rolex salespeople, from you know people in authorized dealerships, that Rolex is going to be really investing in the Cellini line and really making that Cellini line uh, a, a serious player in the you know dress watch game. Does anyone know where they? Uh, anyone know where they are priced? I don't know. That would be very interesting. I'd love to know where the Cellinis are priced. Um, but. Basically, you know, you're competing in the ball game um, that is, although competitive, still kind of laid back. Uh, yeah, sure, you have the you know AP Saxonia, you have the uh, Patek Philippe Calatrava line, you have the Vacheron and Constantine Patrimony. So at fourteen thousand dollars, they all kind of compete. And at the end of the day, Rolex has more international brand equity than anybody, right? So Rolex theoretically should, with the right planning and with the right execution. Make that Cellini line more important than anyone else's dress line. Like I said, V the Calatrava, the you know, Patrimony, um, or the you know Traditionnel, or, or whatever. Uh, the one exception might be the Calatrava, because the Calatrava genuinely is um, you know one of the most iconic watches of all time in that high-end world. Uh, but still, Rolex has that mass market appeal that Patek Philippe could arguably not have as much. You know, I think. That's very anecdotal, though. That's not like, you know, 
That's very anecdotal. Do you think Rolex should make more chronograph, like their vintage pieces, I'm sorry, and you think they would do well commercially? Uh, no, I, I don't think, tell me more about this lady, <laughs> shut up, yeah, Dean. Uh, I, I don't think that Rolex should do, you know, more vintage, you know, inspired stuff. They don't do it, it's not their, it's not their brand, it's not the direction they're headed in. Uh, they do that, for, they save that for Tudor. I think that Tudor should step up their, their, their line. Uh, Tudor's created, you know, really very, very few cool things to date in the last, since 2012. I mean, they've got the Black Bay. Awesome. I love the Ranger. I thought it was great. Um, you know, but overall, you know, I, I, I love the chronograph heritage, the Monte Carlo, you know, uh, inspiration, the Monte Carlo homage. But beyond that, you know, their their dress models are kind of shitty. Um, a lot of the line just seems kind of broken up. Uh, the, the new heritage chronograph, uh, whatever it was called, the Black Bay chronograph, I thought it was awful looking. I really thought it was bad. So... That's, you know, it's seg it's not segmented, it's just broken. It's kind of um, fractured, you know, in the Tudor line. So I would love to see Tudor introduce a 38 or 39 millimeter chronograph uh, in that vintage kind of vein. I think they're totally capable of it. I think it's within their, you know, realm of possibility. And um, I would be very happy. So, Timepiece Chronicle, Ben, you should follow him, he's very cool, uh, commented, well, what about the Black Bay Black, All Black, Super Black Heritage Vintage Bronze Black? Uh, and that's a great watch, and that, <laughs> that's going to be their only watch, uh, uh, you know, release for next year. GVA212 on Snow, do you think Rolex will add more complications in the Cellini line or keep it simple like now? Uh, great question, I, I don't know, I mean, you know, will, will, they, will they go into the perpetual world? I don't think so, uh, because once you enter that kind of world, I think you really start playing with the big boys. It no longer becomes about brand, but it becomes people that are about to spend 80 grand, uh, and they usually do their due diligence, and they usually know really well what they're doing. You know, so I don't think Rolex will be able to compete against Patek or against Langa or against some big boys in that world. Uh, but I do think Rolex can compete compete within that ten to twenty thousand dollars segment. Uh, the market's just different. The buyers are different. You know, they have different priorities. Uh, vintage triple dates, uh, yay or nay? Definitely. I, I, I love I love vintage triple dates. They're very cool watches. Uh, D Spodek or DZ Spodek on Instagram has a really cool triple date uh, by Leonidas. Uh, really beautiful watch. Go check his Instagram out. He put it on a really nice beads of rice bracelet. Uh, very, very cool. Um, uh, perfect, perfect three watch collection. Um, I don't know. You know, it's it's for everyone's taste. I think I, I did a collection review a couple of weeks ago um, for someone named Ben Clearden, a watch geek uh, in Europe, and uh, we did it on the Theo and Harris YouTube channel. And he has two watches. Uh, one is the Rolex Sea Dweller, and the other is a Cartier. Um, what's the square stepped case Cartier? Like the Centurion or something like that? Whatever it is, I forget the name of it. Uh, but these are the two watches for you two to be able to see the photo right here. And I think that was a very well executed two piece collection. You know, they're two total extremes. You know, it, it's the, the heftiest, bulkiest, you know, kind of watch out there that goes the deepest, you know, or one of the deepest. And you have a watch that probably epitomizes tuxedo class. You know, a watch that is probably from the brand that is most famous, uh, and rightfully so, for that look. Uh, so that to me was a perfect two watch collection, but three watch, I don't know. Yeah. Is Explorer a good Datejust alternative? Uh, yeah, I, I do think that the Rolex Explorer is a good Datejust alternative. I think that if, if you are the kind of person that is looking for vintage proportions, meaning, you know, 36 millimeters, uh, that would, you know, that would, that would, that would work. Uh, 36 millimeter, you know, uh, Datejust, but you don't want to have the Datejust, you know, you want something that's a little bit more sporty. Explorer 1 is what wins. Uh, definitely. AP uh, 15300 or the Patek Philippe Aquanaut. Uh, on, on that head to head, I go with the Aquanaut. Definitely. Um, I think, actually, pursuant to a comment that uh, Goaty had made, name's Dean, um, the, the 15300 and 15400, you know, although they're very cool watches, and not that he agrees, I think they're very cool watches and they do bring a lot of value in a lot of ways, the proportions throw me off. I think that on the Royal Oak, uh, more so important than movement uh, are the proportions of the original design. That's key. Uh, and those watches lose those proportions uh, Objectively, and in my opinion, that matters. So, um, so yeah, I give it to the Patek Philippe Aquanaut in a second. Cartier Tank Luis 18 karat vintage mechanical uh, thoughts. Uh, I I love the, I love all vintage Cartier. I made a video a while ago about vintage Cartier. The description or the link will be in our description uh, for you guys on YouTube. 
Uh, they're probably my favorite brand out there. You know, to me, it's Rolex and Cartier. Um, I, I would take, I love the Patek Philippe 96 reference. I think it's a beautiful watch. Uh, one of the coolest watches of all time, you know, because it's small and it's kind of undesirable. It's, you know, it's not the 570, so people don't really have that um, collectible appeal. Uh, plus, they're relatively inexpensive, relatively. Uh, but to me, even then, Cartier takes the cake. Uh, Tank Normal, Tank Sintre, uh, you know, they're so, Tank Louis. Santos Dumont, uh, there are just endless Cartier, you know, Bangalore, the crash. There are so many freaking models that, uh, that all respect what a Cartier design is, right? A precious metal case, white Roman dial, uh, and inventive, ever changing that case design. So I think that, you know, I think that's very important um, that Cartier always keeps their foundational or their kind of core vision on what a dress watch should look like and consistently reinvents it. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Ask TNH Live. Uh, it means the absolute world that you tuned in. Hope you have an awesome uh, Saturday. Don't forget to check out uh, this week's Rent TNH on Monday uh, and subscribe to this video if you enjoyed it. That's it, see you guys on Monday.